So today, we're in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, 14. I've entitled this at Liberty But Not Dominated. And so we'll go and I'll read the first verse that we're going to cover, 1 Corinthians 6, 12. We'll pray and then I uh, hopefully can unpack this a little bit for us. So 1 Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and kindness. And may we understand the magnificent truths that you revealed to us. May we not be dominated by error or by sin, but may we be liberated by your power that brings us to yourself, forgives sins, gives us a relationship with you. Help us understand your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we go to verse 12 here, uh, there we go. Um, this is one where exactly you come into a problem because languages differ in sounds. The meaning you can find but the sound's different. So when there's a play on words, for instance, in English, there's certain words that we make a play on words because they sound similar and it's ironic or it makes a point. But when the words don't sound similar in a different language, it's hard to translate. So let me unpack that. Paul says, all things are lawful for me. Before we go any further, he mentions this twice. Part of the interpretive issues that arise in 1 Corinthians have to do with slogans. There are many slogans in 1 Corinthians. Let me explain the issues because we'll run into this until I'm done preaching on 1 Corinthians or until the Lord returns, whichever comes first. <clears throat> or I go to be with the Lord. That could happen first, too. Now, the slogans, we're introduced to slogans right away in 1 Corinthians 1. And there we know that it was their slogans, because Paul tells us that, and that they're wrong to have them. I am of Paul, I am of Peter or Cephas, I am of, or of Apollos, of Peter, of Christ. So they were sectarian, and they had slogans aligning themselves, supposedly with certain uh, preachers that they thought had something better than the other preacher. Paul rebukes that by teaching them about Christ crucified and what this is all about. However, that was clear enough that it was their slogan, it's wrong, Paul doesn't agree with it. But keep in mind that there are other slogans, some of which are good that Paul writes, some of which are theirs which Paul reinterprets, and some of them don't appear as we reading our English Bible, Bible to be a slogan at all. So here we have slogans, and it's pretty clear because Paul recites the same one twice and refutes it and then reinterprets it. And we'll, so we'll see how that works. All things are lawful for me. Most scholars, and I think they're right on this, having spent a lot of time studying this, that's their slogan. And they were using it a certain way. And they were using it in a wrong way. All things are lawful for me. That's their slogan. We're at liberty. And then, but then Paul refines that. But not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me. But I will not be dominated by anything. That's what Paul says about their slogan. That's his two qualifiers. Let me list those two. First qualifier to their slogan, all things are lawful for me. Not all are profitable or advantageous or beneficial. I'm giving the full range of meaning and applying it to, for the church and others. It's one thing to say all things are lawful. I have liberty in all things. But what if you're harming your brother? That'll come up later. Not all things are loving. Not all things edify. Not all things are beneficial for the church. 
And so we have a discussion about liberties that can be taken that would harm others, and therefore they're not loving, and therefore they're wrong in that sense. So that's the first qualifier. Not everything is advantageous, profitable, or beneficial. And then the second qualifier, but I will not be dominated by anything. That's what Paul says. Now, that's the one that comes out as a really powerful play on words in the Greek, but it just simply doesn't come into English. And I don't know that there's a translation, at least that I have in my logo software, that brings it out. I'll read one that a scholar uh, uses that might help. The words, I have them transliterated, exestin, which would be the word permissible, and then excess. Uh, Excessin, uh, but not all things are exousiazo. Uh, and that exousiazo would be having authority over or dominated. So something like this. You could say, I'm free to choose this. And the response might be, but the thing you choose may choose to enslave you. And you're going to wish you didn't have that liberty. Now, there's many examples of this, for example, addiction. But I remember one time I was at a, a number of years ago, I was at a gas station in line with everybody else. And they have a sign sometimes about how old you have to be in order to buy cigarettes. Okay, when you had to be born. And so I'm standing there and uh, a young lady comes in. And she had just gotten past that date. So she's buying the cigarettes. And it wasn't me that said this, but there was a man standing there and said, you might be want to think twice about this, because once you start, it's very hard to quit. That's what he said to the young lady who was going to exercise her liberty. Now, we can understand that anyone who ever smoke and try to quit, would think, yeah, I have a liberty to do this, but it may dominate me to be harmful in the long run. That's, that's an illustration. This is even more serious, because it turns out that their liberty had to do with pornea and immorality. It wasn't even a valid liberty. So Paul says, yes, all things are lawful, but I don't want the thing that's lawful for me to be my slave master because I submitted to it. And we'll be talking about that, some applications. So that's the qualifier. But in, in, in both cases is a strong adversity. This, but not this. And so he's responding to their um, claim. I have a... a thing I wrote down here that I wanted to tell you, I think applies. It's my statement. Slogans are found throughout 1 Corinthians. We must be careful to examine the context to see which are wrong slogans, which can be valid with the correct context, that's here, which are seriously misleading, like I am of Apollos earlier. Some have taken their slogan to be Paul's and thereby misled the church. In other words, people read 1 Corinthians. There's a slogan. They think Paul is saying that, but he's in fact quoting them in order to refute them, and therefore a lot of confusion in the history of the church in regard to interpretation of 1 Corinthians. And I just already mentioned the play on words. So I can't say I have everything totally nailed down, but I work as hard as I can to make sure that before I preach this, I can give you the most likely scenario and what some others may have said about it. But I think this is the best reading. All things are lawful for me is their slogan. Paul rebuts it with some qualifiers. In regard to being under the law, being under the old covenant, we have freedom. We're not under that. But it, there's also things that we wouldn't want to do. Their claim is all things are lawful without much of a restriction. The first qualifier, by the way, uh, <coughs> sumphero, it can also be translated advantageous or profitable. 
And so whatever we have freedom in, Christians know that we also need to have wisdom and discretion and discipline. Because we uh, will want to join Paul and say, I don't want to be dominated and harmed by what is a freedom. So um, Dr. Fee says the truly Christian contact, conduct is not predicated on whether I have the right to do something, that is, but uh, whether it is to my own benefit or not, but whether I have, whether my conduct is good, meaning ultimately helpful for those around me. I'm covering this in detail because it'll be a long time before we get to 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. We'll get to 1 Corinthians 8, okay, we know we have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So there are other considerations. And the primary one is that we want to honor God, we want to love God and serve Him, and we want to care about the well-being of the other people, the brothers and sisters in Christ. We want to be concerned about the honor of the gospel and Christ himself, and also that we don't damage our own selves or families and whatever happens. Does that make sense? I'm really uh, spent a lot of time. I hope we can get out what Paul is saying here, because it's been discussed in odd ways in church history. So, Here's the citation. Someone, a brilliant Greek scholar, Dr. Thistleton, came up with a translation that would bring out the wordplay. I think he did the best. Here it is. <clears throat> Liberty to do anything, but I will not let anything take liberties with me. That's the wordplay. So you have liberty in both ends of it. And that's how it comes out in Greek. So I think that's a good one. I have liberty to do anything, but I will not let anything take liberties with me. With the further qualification, these liberties aren't things that God calls sin that we can never do. Now, I, I want to give you an example. Turn to John 8, 33, 34. In that case, the topic was being free. Jesus came, talked to people who claimed to believe, him and believe in him, and he said, if you become my disciples, you'll be free indeed. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So they started to debate with him because they had pride that they had never been enslaved anyhow. So what do they need? That. John 8, 33, 34. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants, and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. They were saying, we're Abraham's children, and by definition, we're free. Jesus is saying, no, you're a slave to sin, and claiming to be free is a lie. And you need me to free you from sin. Does that make sense? And there is the same idea. You can be free and, and be totally enslaved to anything and everything, and the freedom is simply destroying you. Boy, don't we see that nowadays with some of the drugs that are coming in to the country? And I don't want the sermons only to apply to Americans, but the drugs that are coming into this particular country are killing people sometimes one shot, one, one thing. And I don't know if you've seen that in the news. A teenager decides, oh, I'm going to try something, and they're dead the first time. And so we have to be very wary about what's going on and what happens. Let's go to 
uh, another instance of this same slogan being used later, and that's in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, 24. 1 Corinthians 10, 23, 24. Everything is permissible. This is a different translation, but it's the same phrase. But not everything is beneficial. Again, similar word, the same word about profitable. And then he says, um, everything is permissible, but not everything builds up. So again, Paul takes their slogan and then interprets it in a way to refute some of the things they're saying and doing. Then he goes on to say, verse 24, no one is to seek his own good, but the good of the other person. That is his way of correcting them. Now, the context in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 10, this is a preview for when we get to that, is food offered to idols. So here's an idolatrous city, Corinth, the, the religious things that happened in the city were full of religion and spirits and demons and idols and offerings. And so here's a potpourri of religious demonic activity. And so Christians were in a quandary that when you went to the meat market to buy something, had it been offered to an idol? And so in order to answer that, and we won't do that today, we'll wait till we get to 1 Corinthians 10, but let me give you another way this same principle is applied. Paul said this, that if somebody invites you over and you're having a meal and you eat whatever it is, it's just meat, nothing more said, fine. It, the substance of the meat is just what it is. But if someone invites you to a gathering and they're saying, we're having an offering to Zeus or Hermes or uh, Dionysus or whatever they're doing, this is offering, this is our offering, it's been offering to the idol, we're offering it, here's our service, let's eat, then you can't do it. Because you don't want to damage them by affirming their idolatry. So it wasn't totally easy to do, but Paul dealt with it. Uh, for example, verse 27, unbelievers invite you over. You want to eat, go eat anything said before you without raising questions for the sake of conscience. But if they say it's from a sacrifice. Don't eat it because they think you're agreeing with their idolatry. So it's not just us in the 21st century that has difficulties deciding what to do. Most everyone has extended family that aren't serving God. Most everyone is confronted with uh, wicked spiritual things, wicked moral things that are around us. And we want to be in the world, but not of the world. We want to be witnesses. We want to stay free. But on the other hand, difficulties arise. So as we study together, preach through 1 Corinthians here, as I'm doing the best I can by God's grace, we'll have to have wisdom to apply things to, that are slightly different in our world, but the principles are the same. We want to honor God. We don't want to be enslaved. We want to stand for the gospel, but we don't want to try to force unbelievers to act like Christians to make us happy because that just Christianizes people and doesn't actually convert them. So that's the statement I'm going to make. Now let's go to verse 13. This one is really uh, even more disputed throughout the centuries of church history because of the difficulty of determining where the slogan starts and where it ends. So after many, many hours of study and reading, let me try to get this as simple as can. Turn, I can. The NIV from 2011, the newest version, adds, you say. So let me read it. You say, food is for the stomach, the stomach for food. God will destroy them both. I think that's the correct rendering. 
that that's their slogan. You say it's not in the Greek, it's added for clarity. <clears throat> the body, excuse me, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. The word for sexual immorality is pornea. And we'll see the next time, I mean, Corinth, in Corinthians, that they were claiming liberty to go to prostitutes. And um, that'll be in a couple of weeks. Next week, I'm going to preach from Luke 13 for Communion Sunday. I want to emphasize uh, redemption and atonement. But literally, the Corinthian church was a mess, and they were claiming liberties that no one has. So the body, so they're claiming the body isn't important, and we'll get to that. That's the heart of the problem. Whether it was a version of Gnosticism already there before formal Gnosticism existed, whether it's Stoicism or Cynicism, there's philosophies floating around Corinth, and some of which said, whatever's done in the body doesn't matter because it's of no significance. There's a spiritual reality that transcends the body, and so therefore, don't even worry about it. Do anything you want. The body's temporary anyhow. Paul is rebuking that idea forthrightly and powerfully, and the ground for the rebuke is the fact of the resurrection from the dead. The body is not meaningless. Ordinary life is not meaningless. Serving God now in the body that he's given us and through... Fellowship, meals, the world we live in, the things around us are going to hit us powerfully and sometimes negatively. Every Christian has decisions to make, but they need to be grounded in what we know to be true from the Bible. And Christianity is not a mystical religion saying the body is of no consequence. And I'll show you in the applications that there's two ways that's been practiced in church history, both refuted in the Bible. Paul's position is the body is God's idea that the whole person is important. And there'll be a resurrection. The body not meant for sexual immorality, pornea, but for the Lord, the Lord for the body. So they justified their morals. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about what influences may have happened in Corinth that caused them to believe that. Can't totally settle it, but you know, whatever it was, it was wrong. Um, so this version of the NIV, I think, is the correct way of highlighting what their slogan was, although others see it differently. So... I believe that, again, it's their slogan because that's why he's correcting it. Let me cite a couple others. Gardner says, Paul's teaching at this point is broad. The body is truly significant in the purposes of God. Therefore, any sexual, sexually immoral act involving the body is wrong. There can be no dualism in which the body as matter, says Gardner, has no existence or significance beyond the phenomenal. In other words, well, the real world is some ethereal one that we can't see. I, I, that's my statement. He goes on, this is not the worldview which Paul works. Uh, dear ones, objective reality is our friend. And to lose touch from that is not good for anyone to go into some altered state, some mystical scenario in which you're not even really attached, and who knows what happens. And in the 70s, when I was in college, 
there were an awful lot of ideas that, uh, what, what did they call it back then? They had, they had different words for it. The, the psychedelic. There you go. See, even an old man can remember something. The psychedelic, you know, the kind of weird uh, thing that doesn't really attach to anything real. That is not biblical idea. We want to know the truth. The truth about what is valid and what is godly and what is real but yet sinful and in rebellion against God. The truth revealed in Scripture is our friend. We want to know what it is. Sanctification for the Christian never involves detachment from the body or using meditative techniques to gain an altered state of consciousness or hoping to escape into some better reality through meditation. I've written about that. We've done conferences about it in groups, in another group I was with, and I would still warn people, do not get drawn in to the idea that the really good reality, the, the ultimate reality is some mystical state. Here's my statement I have here in my notes. This false view of the present and future of the body is corrected in chapter 15, where Paul teaches the importance of the future resurrection of the body. There will be accountability, according to the Bible, for deeds done in the body. So the body is for the Lord. Let's go to verse 14. And the Lord raised up, and God raised up the Lord, and he will also raise us up by his power. So Paul brings this statement about the resurrection into the discussion right here where these slogans are being addressed. Here's the point. <laughs> God does raise the dead. And there's a future judgment that people will have to give account to God. He raised the Lord. So proof that the body is significant that Paul gives is the fact he raised the sinless one, the Savior, the virgin-born Son of God, the creator of the universe who created all things out of nothing. And I often cite John 1, 1 through 18. Or you could go to Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is the creator. The creator came into our world, the sinless one, born of a virgin, as prophesied in the Old Testament, who lived a sinless life, who in the incarnation is fully human, fully God, the incarnate son, who predicted his own death, burial, and resurrection, and so, after his resurrection, he appeared to witnesses. They touched him. Even doubting, doubting Thomas touched him. Real resurrection body. In John, he ate fish with them. I like that. I like eating fish. Uh, he had a real resurrection body. There's a very supper of the Lamb we're looking forward to, the dining with the king. And so this ground of the gospel itself, the incarnation of the creator, his death, burial, and his bodily resurrection, not a phantom resurrection, a real one. That is just rock-solid foundational Christian doctrine. And to give that away so that we can be more like Eastern religion is blasphemous. We do believe in the person and work of Christ and the resurrection from the dead. In fact, 
Paul said on trial, I stand here on trial for the resurrection of the dead. Some Greek philosophers had a different idea. Now, what's the significance of this? That the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, is propitiatory. Jesus died to avert the wrath of God against sin. The sinless one died, paid the penalty so we could be free and forgiven and come into relationship with God. God's wrath was resting on us, and no altered state of consciousness will ever remove it. But Jesus Christ, God the Son, does. Now let me cite a verse as I give a call to repent and believe the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5.10, 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, good or bad. We preach the gospel and call all, the universal call the gospel, to turn to him. We're telling people that this is the way to have forgiveness of sins, assurance of salvation, hope of eternal life, and to be righteous when we appear before God in judgment because of the imputed righteousness of Christ. Today, if you have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, today, Believe upon him, trust in him, turn to him, and serve him, because therein is forgiveness of sins, redemption, and atonement, and a future hope. And I would also warn all of us, there is no hope in thinking that the world as we know it, fallen as it is, is evolving spiritually into paradise without any future judgment. That is a lie. I wrote a book refuting that lie and did a lot of research, including talking face to face with some who believe that, attending their conference and uh, debating one in particular. So Christ is raised from the dead. So what are the Corinthians up to here? What's their agenda? Well, we're going to find out. Their thinking was the body is the problem. And the way we're going to handle that is through being libertines. We'll do whatever we want. As long as it's in the body, it accounts for nothing, and we won't be accountable for it. We're looking to some ethereal, bodiless, amorphous future, and none of this will matter. Paul disagrees strongly. No, what we do matters. The deeds done in the body always matter. And by the way, there are degrees of reward and punishment, both. But it's, it's the duty of all preachers to tell people the truth and to cover the text for what it says in its own right. So only a few slides today because I knew the, of the complex topic. The two points of application are there are boundaries to Christian liberty. Number two, we must not allow ourselves to be dominated by what is sinful, but love one another. Love one another. Let's go to verse, or slide number six, which would be 1 Peter 2, 16. I have here material from 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Let's start with 1 Peter 2, 16. Live as people who are free, 
not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Now, let's unpack that. What is the intent here? If you go back to what I cited and, and we looked at in John 8, Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. This is the people who supposedly believed. They said, well, thanks for the, they didn't say it this way. Thanks for the offer, but we've never been in bondage, so we don't need freedom. That's a delusion, isn't it? So here it's the same th basic idea, not using the freedom as brothers and sisters in Christ as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. But servants would be those who are subservient to serve another. So someone could say, you Christians have an odd religion because you're commanding people to give up their liberty in order to be a doulos, a slave, a servant to Christ, and now you can't go do whatever you want. So how can you be a servant and free at the same time? And it doesn't make sense to people that don't know Christ. But once you're converted, you know immediately that it makes sense. I was never as free as I was when Christ set me free from bondage, from hatred, from wrath, from blasphemy, from all the things that were driving me. And in one day, I came back, said to my coworkers, who wondered what I was going to do because I was threatening to do harm to the preacher who had brought religion to my girlfriend. And they said, what happened? But they looked at me could see something was different. They didn't dare ask for a while. I said, I accepted Christ. That's how I saw it. But later I found out he accepted me. I didn't deserve it. It's kind of phenomenological language. But the point is, they thought... I'd come back, and that was it. I was so angry. I came back free. And we have to preach this, even though to the world, they look at us and think, of all the people, you're not free, because look at all the way you can't do this, you can't do that, and you have to be this way or that way. How's that free? Let me assure you, being servants of God in Christ is true liberty. And it's of eternal value. And therefore, our freedom is in Christ. And the things that enslaved us before are things that he sets us free from. Gradually, positionally, immediately, and as a process as we grow in him. Now, let's look at the Second Peter section. And when, as we do, 2 Peter 2.19, still on the slide here. Turn in your Bibles, or however you, some, some people can use the little phone and get the Bible on that and follow it that way. 1 Peter 2.13, well, let's read the context, and I think it'll help us understand what Peter means by freedom and what the Holy Spirit's revealed. Now, in the midst of 2 Peter 2, um, excuse me, I looked down on my notes. This is the passages I was going to read for 1 Peter 2. Let's read it anyhow. Submit to every human, verse 13, every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. Verse 14, for it is God's will, verse 15, that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Verse 16, submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Verse 17, honor, this is the next verse, 
honor everyone, love the brothers and sisters, fear God, honor the emperor, and therefore, that's what Christian freedom looks like. And let me unpack that. I, I apologize. My eyes went down. I saw Second Peter. I was looking at 1 Peter. There's the context. What does it look like to be Christians who are free but living in a world that would like to enslave us? We are free to be good citizens because the ultimate thing we have can't really be taken away from us. No one can take from you, dear Christians, eternal life. When Polycarp was martyred, and they said he was 86 years old, and they were saying, save yourself. Have respect for your old age. Save yourself. Renounce Christ and curse Christ, they usually wanted him to do, and we won't light the fire. You won't, you won't be burned. You won't be martyred. And he said, 80 and 6 years I've been serving him. He's done me no harm. Why would I curse him now? And he was, he was martyred. Now, we are able to pray for those who hate us and be law-abiding as long as they're not trans cause, demanding that we quit preach the, preaching the gospel or worshiping God and so on, and not fear eternal harm. We can be kind in our greetings to the people around us, honor everyone, timao, to show honor. We can love the brothers and sisters. We must do so. We must fear God and honor the emperor. Now, in, Paul's, in Peter's day, I can assure you, the emperors were not very honorable. We don't have too many honorable leaders now either, do we? But we can honor the idea that we need civil government or we'd be under so much chaos that life would be unlivable and it would be even harder to get the gospel. And we pray that we'd gain better restraint of evil, but we are good citizens. Now to chapter, to, to the second Peter, this is the false teachers. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. Since people are enslaved to whatever defeats them. The false teachers making grand pronouncements, Second Peter 2, claiming that they knew things ordinary Christians don't know, says in verse 18, the verse before this, by uttering boastful, empty words, they seduce with fleshly desires and debauchery people who have barely escaped from those who live in error. So the false spirituality in that case is we're going to be boastful, we're going to do this, we're going to revile even the spiritual realm, the angelic realm, the divine counsel. We're going to take charge and be masters of our own destiny. And Peter rebukes that. Did you know that almost every year that's being promoted and taught today in the name of the churches are heirs that existed in the time of the Bible and they are rebuked. If people studied the Bible and read it carefully in context, much of this would not even interest them. But instead, the mystics, the dominion theology, the uttering boastful claims into the heavenlies draws huge crowds while careful Bible teaching gets ho-hum. Ho-hum, ho-hum. We don't need all this scholarly stuff and we just need to have an experience. And I know there was a version of that when I was a new Christian. There were preachers that came by and said, it's better felt than telt. Now, that's not a good... Talk about slogans. Okay. The Corinthians had slogans. So these, better felt than tell. Well, I feel great. It must be God. 
So did a lot of people that were in cults. One last slide. Here we go. Galatians 5, 13 and 14. Thank you. <laughs> For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity of the flesh, but for love, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, you might say, why does he say one word and then have a bunch of words? Did you know that in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments are called the Ten Words? It's what it says, Ten Words, meaning a, a statement of God's law. And so this here from Leviticus 19.18 is saying, here is one way and the way and the most important way to be both loving and free at the same time. Love, by love, serve one another. When you see a need and you're able to, you take action. And I thank everyone for that sort of thing. It's been amazing as different needs have arisen, including in our own family, People come and they want to help, and others, when they suffer, people reach out and help. That's what Christians do. They care for each other. We know the world hates us, but we love one another, and that is fulfillment of the law. So rejecting legalism is not promoting license. The issue in Galatians was whether Christians had to keep the Mosaic Covenant rules. Paul said no. And he said those who tried to demand that were putting Christians in bondage and taking away their freedom. But the law of love transcends the covenants. To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, Jesus said is the greatest. We need commandments. There's no law against loving God, neighbor, family, and brothers and sisters we have in Christ. Formerly, the Galatians were enslaved, and Paul said that, Galatians 4, 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. Did you know that the pagan deities don't have too many morals that they worry about. How about when Moses is on Sinai gaining the ten words, what were they doing at the foot of the mountain? Well, we can't see Moses anymore. Let's make a calf. And then they had this big party. How many of you know the golden calf doesn't care what you do? What if the golden calf did care what you did? You melted down and make a golden donkey. I don't know. What are you going to do? The fact is that if you have come to Christ and your sins are forgiven and you have the joy of the Lord, that's freedom. And the more common lament for us Christians is that we're not as free as we should be because we're so enticed by the world around us. And we all have that battle to fight. But God has given us a way of serving him and one another by his grace. So God transferred us out of the authority of darkness. We were enslaved to idols. God brought us to his light. And we're not here to take vengeance Leviticus 19.18, you shall not take vengeance or bear grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh, Leviticus 19.18. So I thank God. Thank you for being patient with me as I got uh, confused about what passages I was looking at, but we got it straightened out. And I thank you for all your prayers for Pastor Eric. He taught Sunday school this morning. I'm so thankful for that, and uh, we watch as we 
together pray and God brings people back to health and we serve by him. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and kindness, for your mercy and grace. And though we have difficult passages we're studying and learning, may you change us from the inside out so we have love and kindness toward one another. And we warn those who are perishing to turn to you. We thank you The Pastor Eric is getting back around, and we continue to pray for his full recovery from his accident. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. Next week, the sermon will be from Luke 13. You want to study ahead. Communion Sunday will be in Luke 13, and it's the section about the woman who was bound for 18 years, who was loosed by Jesus. That'll be next Sunday. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.